people say we give voice to people. I don't like this expression. They have voices. Our job is to make sure their voices are heard. I was very interested, not necessarily looking at one country and one war, but seeing the parallels between all of them. You know, the work I do, I, I call the legacy of war, because it doesn't matter if you're talking to somebody who was in a conflict 50 years ago or five days ago. What they say and experience is the same thing. And we tend to focus just on one war and say this is all that's happening. And we don't look at the history, we don't see how these things reflect on each other. You know, what was important for me is not to show the violence of war. If you have a picture of people firing guns or tanks or planes, a young boy sees this and is excited. And I wanted to do the opposite. I wanted to show the consequences of war on everyday people. I realized something um, after years of doing this work. I was photographing a woman called Khulud. And Khulud had been paralyzed by a sniper. Um, when I first met her, she was living in Lebanon in the Bekaa Valley with her husband, Jamal. And she was in this tent that was made themselves, bits of cardboard, plastic, uh, posters ripped down from billboards. And in fact, Jamal, he whispers to me his greatest fear. This man who has lost everything, his greatest fear is that she does not love him as much as he loves her. And that's the moment I realized that I'm not a war photographer. I document love. I knew that this was a story that I was going to have to find a way to tell because it was something so important. And so even when I was in a wheelchair, I would be saying to my sister, maybe we can put a camera on here. And she was like, no, stop it, stop it. <laughs> get better first. But I think, again, what was different is it was always difficult for the 10 years before my accident, photographing people. I always thought I was there for the right reasons to do the right thing. But obviously, I was always, you know, a white man traveling to a place I could always leave. You know, so even though I did it from my heart, there was always this, this separation. What I knew now is that nobody working was in a better position to tell these stories than me. You know, losing three limbs, um, the kind of injuries I went through, very few people even survived that. There were very few war wounded as bad as me. So I knew that I would have quite literally walked in the footsteps of the people that I was photographing and that we would understand each other's stories in a completely different way. You know, it's hard enough anyway if you're escaping Syria as a family, but imagine somebody's in a wheelchair, imagine you have limited um, you know, opportunities to get in the queue for food, whatever it is. So these were stories that I felt was important to highlight because these were people often missing out. One of the things I love to do is, is portraits. I started out obviously as a fashion photographer, music photographer, and I've always seen myself as a portrait photographer. Often, you know, when you meet a family, say in a refugee camp, they're very embarrassed about where they live you know, they feel uncomfortable. You're photographing somebody at the worst moment of their life. And if I could do something that also makes them feel that you're taking them away from that, that you're showing them and representing them with dignity. And so I have this bed sheet and I, I put it up and the person stands against it and you take them away from that environment and focus on the person. Because as soon as you see them, in, in the background, if you see destroyed buildings, if you see a refugee camp, you label them as that, as a refugee. But these people are not refugees, they've become it. But they had lives before, they'd be teachers, doctors, lawyers. And so I hope with these portraits you, you return that. Yeah, my work was, was difficult. Sometimes I questioned if I was doing the right thing. I remember in uh, South Sudan photographing a young boy who'd been shot. And I was in a small hospital being run by Medicine Sans Frontières. And I say hospital, it was just maybe three mud huts. And there was one doctor, an Australian doctor. And he was running around trying to save these lives. They were fighting all around us. It was very chaotic. And this one boy who was maybe 12 years old, had been shot in the stomach and the arm. And he probably was a child soldier. And you say, do I take his photograph? Do I make this image? And I can tell you that it's important 
that you know what's happening in South Sudan, you know about child soldiers, you know about civilian casualties. But as a human being, pointing your camera at a dying boy goes against every instinct you have. I took a couple of pictures and put my camera down and just sat with the boy for the rest of the day. But that evening, I saw Dr. Murray and I said, you know, I don't think I can take a photograph again. I said, I felt like a vulture, like physically sick today. But he explained to me, and he was from Australia, from a small village. And he said, growing up, he said, it was photographs like yours in Sunday magazines, in National Geographic, he said, that inspired me to become a doctor, that inspired me to go and work for Medicine Sans Frontieres. He said, that's why your photos are important. You know, somebody came to an exhibition like this once, they looked at my work and they said, do you think you can change the world with your photographs? And I said, no, but I think I can inspire the person that can. And really that's what my work was always about, was trying to tell these stories, to share these stories in the hope that somebody smarter than me, somebody with more money than me, somebody with better skills than me would actually be able to make a real difference.